that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, you know, being at IAP is being able to be a part of that and, and really, um, f- you know, make those connections flourish and, and just bring these people together. Cause I'm telling you, it's, it's the answer to all of our problems in our industry. And Hey Matt, how's it going? It's going fantastically, Josh. How are you? I am good. Question for you. You got it. Have you ever heard of IAPA? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've, I've heard of that. The International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. Where have you heard of that? Um, only for the past like 30 years of working in the industry, it's been the um, association that supports the industry and one of the best trade shows ever Ever. that happens in Orlando that I get to go to. Well, not this year, but most years I get to go. That's, that's true. We will, we will highlight that. We will touch on that there, that you are going to be greatly missed. Uh, But it was, it was, as many people said, the the right decision uh, not to come. And it means that we just get to be excited to see you next year at IAPA Expo, because like you said, it is, the greatest trade show ever. Uh, we might be a little biased from that because I think we, you know, we we have a strong connections to the show, to the association, uh, and to so many of the people within it. That's how you and I met during IAPA Expo sixteen years ago. Wow, 2000, 2007. I was a show ambassador, uh, which is uh, part of the internship program for for the show. And one of the sessions that you were a part of that is still held to this day was called the Career Slam. And I went to that as a junior in college. So as kind of a, a mentee for it, you were there as a mentor. And I I guess we, we probably exchanged business cards and I probably sent you an email wishing you a happy Thanksgiving after because that's, uh, that's what I tried to do with all my business cards <laughs> after that. And then look at that. So if, if not for IAPA and IAPA Expo, the Attraction Pros podcast would not exist. You know what else is interesting about that that you allude to uh, in this episode is that when we talk about networking, it's not always about that immediate connection, right? You know, or or I should say, you may not get something out of that connection immediately. Yes, you're going to have a, a a conversation with that person. You're going to exchange business cards. You're going to maybe wish them a happy Thanksgiving after I after the IAPA Expo. But you know, so often the connections that you make need to be nurtured so that they can they can mature when they are ready to mature. Um, yeah. And I think when I talk to a lot of young professionals specifically, they've got an idea that, oh, I'm going to go talk to Josh and I'm going to get a job right away. And rarely does it work that way. Um, so when you're listening to this, uh, you know, if you are listening to this, the week of IAPA, take a breath. It's okay you know, shell out those business cards, make those connections, but know that it's probably going to take some time for those to come uh, come to fruition. Well, first of all, if you are listening to this during the week of IAPA Expo, thank you. You're probably out for a run right now on International Drive with your AirPods in. So <laughs> we're right there. We're right with you in, in your ears. Uh, and, and excited to talk to Michael Shelton, who, again, if you're at the Expo, you'll probably see him at some point throughout the week. Michael is the Vice President and Executive Director of IAPA North America, and he's been with the association for uh, for a few years. But prior to that, he was with Highland Hills uh, Waterworld for about 25 years. So he is no stranger to the industry whatsoever, been in the business for quite a long time. And it's amazing to hear his perspective as an operator and now looking at it through the lens of the association. And there's a number of similarities and a number of differences as well. And we get to talk really kind of about, about IAPA's culture. What's it like within the organization, within the association, which I'll be honest for something for, for me, that's something I hadn't really considered probably until much more recently, because so many people think of IAPA as this, it's just this governing body hovering over the industry, but just like any park or attraction or any supplier company, it's the people behind that that are truly making it all making it all work and bringing it to life. Well, and speaking of the people, one of the things that Michael also talks about is 
really what IAPA's goal is and what they work so hard to do throughout the year is to connect members, right? When you think about all the, the problems that get solved, you know, through conversations that people have, whether it's at the trade show or over the phone or a Zoom call or at the bar, all these conversations that are had, people are solving problems and they're creating new things and potentially innovating and making deals. And that just makes the industry stronger. It makes it more enriching. It makes it more interesting. Ultimately, that makes it better for the guests. It makes it better for the employees. So, you know, the more that members can connect with one another, uh, the better off the entire industry is. Well said, well said. And it talks about the importance of sharing and that members love sharing and that, yeah, if you do one thing at uh, at your park or at your property and you say, oh, that's really cool. We need to we need to protect that. We need to keep that as a secret. Usually by the time you get to IAPA Expo and if it comes up in conversation, you want to tell other people about that because they're also telling you about what might work within your facility. And then, of course, uh, he says something that uh, you and I and many other people have been saying for many years, if you're preparing to go to IAPA Expo, and that's wear comfortable shoes because of the nine miles of aisles on that trade show floor. So uh, they, they've had to move some things that have been on the trade show floor off of the show floor this year because of the overwhelming demand for exhibitors. Uh, so again, yeah, bring, bring those walking shoes, put those, uh, um, what are they called? The Dr. Scholl's, like the gel inserts. I've, yep. I've gotten a lot of use out of those over the years of, of uh, protecting my feet uh, throughout the week. And, uh, you know, get ready to, to do a lot of walking and, and get ready to see a lot of great new things as well. So should we uh, go ahead and get to this interview with Michael so that he can tell us all about IAPA, the Expo, and everything else that we just talked about, but in more detail? Yeah, I guess so. Hey, Michael, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, guys, for having me. Absolutely. So excited to jump into this conversation. So first of all, tell us a little bit about your background and your history in the in the uh, industry. Sure. Um, I'm not sure how far back you want me to go, but I'll start at the very beginning, but I'll be brief. I, I'll i never forget. Uh, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I was kind of a troubled kid. And so always good grades, but always trouble uh, with my, uh, shall we say, citizenship. And uh I was uh, 13 years old and my mom found an article in the local paper that they were building a water slide near us and they were hiring. So my mom said, well, you're not staying home this summer. So I want you to head down and apply for that job. So the next morning, you know, I got up and I said, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. And she goes, well, it's not going to be we, it's going to be you. So hop on your bike and head over and apply. And of course it was six and a half miles away. So I hopped on my bike. I went over and I applied and I got my first job at, at Waterworld, which uh, everyone knows now is a, is a large water park in Denver. Um, but anyway, uh, I spent most of my career there, but fortunately for me, Waterworld was owned by a park and recreation district that had a lot of different facilities. You know, we have senior programs, uh, we have a large golf course, an FEC, an ice arena, many different things. So I kind of bounced around doing different things, you know, with Highland Hills over the years uh, before I ended up being the general manager of the water park. That that was always a dream of mine. Uh, and then uh, fast forward to today and, uh, you know, it was about 2018 and uh, my wife and I uh, had been coming down for years to the IAPA show and to Orlando and, and, you know, the theme parks are our dream. And she said, you know, maybe it's time to to move down there. And so I started doing job search while well, ironically, IAPA was moving its headquarters from Virginia to Orlando at that time. So there were a lot of open positions. So I applied and I was fortunate enough to get the director of education, which, you know, Matt, that's about the time you and I connected a bunch. Uh, and then have had two jobs since then. Uh, I eventually became the director of education, safety, and membership for IAPA, and then most recently the the executive director of North America, which is where I am now. Excellent. I'm kind of curious about uh, the previous position you just mentioned, director of education, safety, and membership. One might think of those as three separate roles. Can you talk about it, you know how how all those combine together? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, it's a great question. I think that was more of a kind of a, an aftermath of the pandemic when, you know, IAPA went through a lot of changes like every other organization. And when we were coming back out of it, you know, everybody had to wear a few extra hats and pick up a few different things uh, because we were lighter in team and resources. And so, um, you know, my background 
uh, ironically, you know, involved much of that. Uh, so it was easy for me. You know, we had a lot of uh, members that I, I serviced in our organization at Highland Hills, as well as uh, handling all the safety for the parks uh, and the recreation district. And then, of course, uh, you know, the education piece that I was working on at IAPA. So it came together nicely. And it, was a, it was a nice fit. And I was glad to be here for IAPA at that time because we just didn't have a lot of people or support at the time. So it worked out very well. So, Michael, one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, now you're working for the Global Association, you know, for the attractions industry, but you were also an operator, you know, starting at a very young age. So, you know, how much of that experience informs your decision now that you're serving the attractions industry, not working within it, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, I think... Uh... I think the easy answer is it's it's very relevant and very necessary. And I can't imagine doing the job I'm in now without the experience I had in operations. Um, you know, we we operate a lot of of things, shows, programs, different things that that touches on my background, but also the knowledge of what I did before. And I'll tell you an interesting story. When I moved to Orlando after being with Highland Hills for so many years, you know, the the vast majority of my career. I was a little nervous, you know, I was like, wow, I'm going down to where all the, you know, the big parks are and, and a lot of uh, people I've looked up to for so many years and I met at the expos and everything and, and I'm going to help them do a better job at what they do. And I wasn't sure how that was going to work. Well, you know, it worked out very well that, you know, I wore a lot of hats. When you come from a smaller organization, you, you are in charge of safety. Sometimes you are in charge of marketing, you are in charge of, you know, operations, different things. And, and, you know, even picking up trash, as we all know, uh, that you do in the parks. And so, you know, when I got down here, I found out I was really well suited for all the different roles. And I feel like it really prepared me well for this role, because not only do I speak the language of this industry, I understand what our members need and what their needs are. And I'm able to guide the association in that direction so that we're always making sure that we're servicing our members in the best way possible. And I think you know, the association needs a good mix of people. And I think we have that here. I think you have people who've been in the association business most of their career that work here at IAPA. And I think that's relevant and very necessary because you need that kind of side of association is not a theme park. An association does not operate the same. We have very different goals and, and a different set of operating circumstances. So uh, you have that side and then you have, uh, you do need the people from the operation side and from the park side. And I think we have a good mix of that. And then we have some people just are, that, that haven't done either. So I think between those three groups, uh, it helps us function very well. Michael, can we, can we, uh, maybe dive a little bit more into that. Can you share a little bit of what IAPA's culture is like? Because for so many people in the industry, uh, perhaps they might be comparing the association to a theme park or might look at it from the lens of the operator or from the supplier. Uh, what is, you know, what is the what is the the work culture? What's the company culture like within the association? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely different. Um, you have to have some clear lanes of responsibility. Uh, it's not like a theme park where anybody can jump in and just take tickets uh, or or pick up trash or, you know, greet a guest at the front gate. Uh, you know, there's specialty areas at IAPA that matter and that we all kind of have to adhere to. So I think you see more of that here than I probably saw in my previous world. Um, and I think it's necessary and and uh, good. And, and I think it's been a part of the culture from, for IAPA for a long time. You know, we, we went through a lot of change through the pandemic, but fortunate for us, we kept some people that have been with the organization for a very long time and we have a lot of new faces, but I think that that has really driven the culture of getting the right products and services to our members uh, in, and the right content that they're looking for. So Michael, one of the things that I know as I've been involved with IAPA for many, many years, you know, so many people talk about the trade show. So many people talk about going to Orlando or, you know, wherever they're going in the in the world around the around the globe to go to the, the trade show, the expo, and and that is quote unquote IAPA. But we know that there's a lot more that the the association offers, or I should say that IAPA offers to the association. So 
Can you describe a little bit, maybe some of those misconceptions of, you know, are people just saying, hey, it's just a trade show, but what are these other things, those, those products and services that you talk about that IAPA can offer to a member that is really driven by kind of that association side of the business versus the operational side? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think first and foremost, I'd say there's nothing wrong with being known as the expert organization because it is what we do best. Uh, it's a big part of what we do. It's the number one way for our members to connect in every possible way. And so, uh, you know, I'm kind of okay with that. But to your point, you know, we're so much more than that. And I kind of learned that as I went through my career. Uh, a lot of people don't know this about me, but this will be my 33rd straight show. Uh, I've, I haven't missed a show in 33 years. And, and, I worked for an organization, luckily, that was very good about, uh, you know, supporting furthering education and experience, you know, of their team. And so we always, every year, you know, could make that trip wherever IAPA was because it wasn't always in Orlando. And so that opened my eyes to much more of what IAPA had and, and had available to me. And there is a lot, whether it's the, the webinars or the education, you know, I was able to attend leadership conference, which was a huge boost for me to really um, see more than I've normally seen. And I think what, what IAPA does best is connect members, whether it's through expos or social events or education or webinars or whatever. And I found that out through my career. I would go to the leadership conference and I would meet people I never would have met before. And I was able to connect with them and, and become friends. And then, you know, every summer, you know, when I was the GM of the water park, I would take a week and go to travel to other parks and, and meet with these people that I, I met through IAPA. And uh, I may have met them through Expo in, in most cases, but there were other events throughout the year where I met people uh, at IAPA social events and whatever. And then, you know, I also became, you know, a certified attractions executive through IAPA. And, and so the certifications there and those programs are there through our professional development. And there's just so much there. And then I think probably the one that the, the things that get overlooked the most that IAPA offers to its members are the intangible things, those things that you pay your membership dues. And I think everybody's kind of like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pay my membership dues. And if I go to Expo, that more than pays for my membership. But they don't think of all of the ways that they're supporting the association and the industry otherwise. And those are our government affairs and advocacy efforts where we're on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have our eyes on bills that affect our parks that, that maybe would have a negative effect on our operations. Uh, we're there to advocate for stricter laws in some cases for like drones that are flying over our parks now and, and how we can have a better voice for our members there. And, you know, those are things your dues go to that you don't see an immediate, you know, dollar amount, but they're important because we all need to advocate for this industry. And then uh, the research we do, uh, you know, we do our, all of our safety reports and, and our member reports and the member reports help us understand more about you as members and how we need to be a better association for members. But uh, the research also does a great job of, of all of our members reporting safety, safety statistics to us so that we can see how we're doing as an industry as it relates to safety and how we all can be better. So I think there's a lot of intangible benefit that people don't see outside of Expo. Uh, and then, you know, most recently, and I'll just elaborate a little because I'm going off the question a little bit, but, um, you know, we've started doing more of these social gatherings and meetups, and we've been going out to the regions across the U.S. And part of the reason is there's a lot of people that don't get to come to Expo. I was very fortunate, you know, the company I worked for, I invested in their team, but not everybody has that ability or is that fortunate or has that funding. And so, you know, it's up to us as IAPA to, to reach out to our members wherever they are. Um, you know, I, I tell everybody the example of the meetup we did last year in, in Minnesota at the Mall of America. And, you know, I think we had about 50 people turn out, which is on the lower side for us, but that was the happiest 50 people I think I'd ever seen. They were so excited that IAPA was there and that they actually got to go to an IAPA event and, and connect. And, uh, you know, we found that this year too, on some of our, uh, lesser served areas. So, uh, so lots, lots to this association that I think a lot of people don't know. Yeah, uh, you know, on the topic of the the social gatherings and the and the meetups, I I've loved seeing all these 
kind of these these micro IAPA expos happening, you know, all, all over the world. It was just a few hours at, at one location. Uh, I live in Chicago, and a few years ago there was a, an event at Six Flags Great America, and it was cool because I was able to was able to take my wife. She was able to to see a, a little bit in, into that side of me and the way that I, I interact with with other industry professionals, and we were able to to just make connections and, and be able to meet people. And you talk about you know IAPA being. Uh, the best way for members to be able to connect. And from that, uh, IAPA kind of like lays the groundwork, but it's up to those individuals to then actually make that worthwhile. Uh, There's a, you know, Matt and I even had a conversation, you know, a few years ago, we were at an event and, you uh, you know, we realized we said, you know, so much of how we network or how we connect is just about showing up and being seen and then kind of going back, you were talking about those intangible benefits of it uh, that sometimes you can't necessarily uh, walk away from the event and saying, OK, this was my investment and this is going to be my exact dollar return, but that it compounds over time. And I've always seen networking as something that is a, has a compound effect. Every single year I, I go and I see people I met last year, I see people I met 15 years ago, and I'm meeting new people that maybe this new relationship is going to come to fruition 15 years from now. I don't know. I just know that of the importance of showing up and being there. And I'm curious as far as maybe advice that you would give, having been on the operator side and that that side of it, of people who might be coming to Expo. This episode is going up the, the week of Expo. So if you're listening to it during Expo, great. If not, you can plan for the next event. Uh, but how people are able to really take advantage of here's here's the the framework and the platform that IAPA has laid out, but I need to do the work to make it worthwhile for me to achieve this compounding network effect. I know that was kind of a ramble of a question, but <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, I think I get where you're headed. Um, I think IAPA Expo is kind of the vehicle to all things IAPA. I think it's the biggest, most noticeable thing and the easiest thing to engage with because there's typically something for everyone. You know, we have over 175 education and and special events this year, which is more than we've ever had. So there's truly something for everyone, whether you're in food and beverage, HR, you know, safety on the manufacturer and supplier side, there, there's truly something for everyone. And I think what it does is it opens your eyes to, you know, the bigger picture of all the things that we do. And then we're really doing a great job of expanding that and giving them out ways to connect outside of Expo. And, um, most of these, you know, when I came over here, one of the things I was able to bring to IAPA was, my desire of what that looks like, what would, you know, as a member for all those years, what would I want for my app? And, and these social events are a great example. I call them social events. Uh, it's an easy word to say. I don't know that that's necessarily how I'd characterize them because we, they involve several things. I think they're a way, you know, we know this uh, and you two especially know that our members love each other. They love to share. It's one of the most sharing industries I, I've ever been in. Uh, And we all know that we're going to get better as an industry as a result. So when we go to these meetups or we do these presents or we do these get togethers outside of Expo, we make sure that we're highlighting a member that people would have always wanted to go see, uh, or even if they haven't, they go there and there's something to see. We'll educate them uh, on what they're doing best at their facility and what works for them. And that's valuable to our members. And then also they get to connect directly with those people that they'll be able to connect with forever. Uh, whether you're a manufacturer and supplier, and now you've seen this facility and you're like, Oh, I could give them some benefit here or there. But even as an operator, you go in and you go, wow, I never even thought I could put signage here. Or I could do this here. And uh, you know, it just keeps, you know, expanding and expanding, you know, and, and never stops. And I think that, you know, for these people who are just starting out or younger or want to do the connection, Connect in any way you can, anywhere you can. It's it's benefited me greatly in my career, and I think you guys would agree. And there's just no end to it, and 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 might also help you decide what you want to do and do you want to leave. I mean, I worked for the same organization for you know 25 years, and um, other people take a different path. They they bounce around from park to park all over the country, and I think whatever suits them. But I think you don't know that unless you get out there and you really interact and and get involved uh, to really find out. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, and one of the things that's been kind of peppered in through a lot of your your uh, last couple of answers were connecting people and getting involved in that type of thing. And and I have to say, one of my favorite benefits of being an IAPA member 
is not necessarily the expo or those meetups, but it's the opportunity to actually work on those things. So as a longtime member of the HR committee or the facility ops committee, um, you know, that's been a huge benefit to work alongside other members to help pick the education sessions and those type of things. And I know there's there's a, a big change that's happening, but yeah. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about whatever you can share in terms of how people can get involved and, you know, maybe be part of some of the planning for this or, you know, let their voice be known, not just through a survey, but in actually helping put some of those things together that benefit other members. Yeah, there's a lot, actually. Uh, and yes, we are going through a little bit of transition with our, our committees, but we still have a lot of committees you can serve on. You can go to our website and we have a page, a getting involved page at our website, and you can see all the different opportunities there. But um, as you know, both of you know, uh, presenting. Uh, at our expo in, in our education sessions and sharing your knowledge uh, is a great way. Uh, teaching one of our existing core courses like our Institute for Attractions Professionals, you know, getting involved as an instructor. Uh, you know, th there's so many different ways. Uh, we have our IAPA Foundation that you can do volunteer work for. Um, there's task forces that we'll be creating uh, moving forward for a lot of these committees that will be assigned a specific task to accomplish for the organization and then turn it over to us and we'll execute it. So it's a great way for, you know, it's a great kind of circular thing that works well. We go to our members, we ask them what they're looking for. They talk to other members, come back to us with recommendations, and then we do what we do best, which is execute the programming. So I feel like there's still tons of ways to get involved and, um, you know, committees is the easy one, but there's other ones too. And we're always looking for great speakers and great presenters and, and people that want to get involved at every level. I'll then even tie that back to earlier to say all those are also great networking opportunities as well, that the more you get involved, the more other like-minded people that that you get to know. And the, like you said, the, the more more sharing that happens and it, and it benefits everybody. Um, so like we mentioned, this episode is going live during the week of Expo. For those who might be there or for those who might be maybe you know listening to this in the morning on the way to the convention center or so, what can they expect, uh, you know, from this year's show, whether it's new experiences or uh, just the overall show this year that uh, that attendees can expect from it? Mm, glad you asked. You're talking about my favorite thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we set out every year to exceed expectations and, and that's tough. It's kind of like every year when we would open the water park or when you would open a facility or, or when you're both into, you know, reinventing your businesses. It's not always easy. Uh, at, at the water park, you're trying to, what's the next best revenue thing or the best next thing that that our guests are going to want? Well, we're no different at IAPA and, and we have one week to do it a year. And uh, so, of course, we last year had a great expo. We have a company that that does a survey for us called Explory. And we had some of our highest scores that we've ever had for our expo. And, and you know, we had great member feedback. So we sat down, the North America, America team sat down after that. And we were like, okay, how do, what do we do now? You know, how do we improve on this? And it was amazing how much, you know, we came up with throughout the year. And so some of the great things you're going to see this year are, uh, you know, from a, a basic level, uh, when you go to the education sessions this year, and we have well over 100 of them, um, you'll be able to see what level they are. There's two different levels if it's introductory versus advanced. And I think that helps because I we heard a lot of members say, you know, I go to a session and I really expected it to be a little more advanced. I've been doing marketing for many years. So, you know, we take that feedback and we really turn it into something productive. So there's a lot of those little nuances that you'll see at the show uh, that we're very proud of and that I think make a difference on the attendee experience. But then there's the the fun ones, the obvious ones. Um, uh, I'll start with the best one where we added food carts back outside. That was a big uh, hot thing. And since we added some of our outdoor exhibits, uh, we decided to put food carts back out there. So that'll be a simple one where people are like, hey, we love the food carts. Uh, but we have an alcohol, beverage, and innovation pavilion on the show floor. That's a huge growing part of our industry. And we would be remiss if we didn't always be answering that call. And we know it's one of the fastest growing parts of our industry. And, and I, I missed what I exactly started as when I when I started at Waterworld, but I was a food and beverage director as my first uh, full-time job. So uh, I did a lot of food and beverage work before I, I got into the management side. But, um, you know, it's a 
probably the fastest growing segment of our industry. So we we have the this pavilion that's going to feature uh, alcoholic beverages for the first time. We have uh, a photography company going around and our app that we use for the show uh, now will take pictures of everyone all over the show floor. So watch for those photographers and then they'll take your picture and then they'll they'll scan your badge, much like you do in a park uh, for a photo pass. And it'll be linked to the Connect Plus app. So you'll be able to have uh, instant access to the photographs uh, that are taken of you uh, throughout the show. Uh, we have a drone show this year, and you've seen the drone shows that a lot of the parks are doing now for entertainment, and uh, we've partnered with Sky Elements to do a drone show this year, and we're actually looking to set a Guinness World Record. Uh, it'll be on Wednesday night of the show uh, floor, so keep your eyes to the sky on Wednesday night, because uh, we're going to do our best to, to set that world record, so uh, I think that's a super fun, you know, added piece, uh, and then I think in general, we we freed up some more space on the show floor. We moved the edge talks off the show floor. We um, moved a few other things that just, you know, we had room on the show floor, so we put it there and, and it worked well, but now we have such demand. Uh, we're completely sold out with a, a fairly lengthy waiting list of exhibitors. So we needed to free up as much space as we could. So there's more exhibitors this year than, than there was last year. And, and uh, I think someone told me about nine miles of show floor to cover. So uh, bring your comfortable walking shoes, but um, there's great surprises around every corner, and and you know they they may seem little, but uh, to us they're very big. And and the only other one I'd mention is this is uh, the first year we're totally eliminating the trade printed trade show program. So in uh, IAPA's sustainability initiatives, I, I think that was an important move. And so everything you need is in the Connect Plus app, and I think that was a great move for us. So Michael, you mentioned. Um a couple of times North America, right? So you're the, mm. you're the head honcho, you're, you're the guru for North America. Um, and certainly the Orlando show is one of the, the biggest and the best, but obviously there's other regions of the, of the world that IAPA is in and represents. And I'm just curious, you know, thinking about the different regions, how different are they? And what are the different needs like for the North American audience versus, you know, South America or Asia? And how do you work together to you know, work together as a global association, but also serve your individual constituencies. Yeah, it's, that's a great question. Um, you know, and just in the last few years, we've started on a much more regional focus uh, with the organization because we found that every region is different uh, and different in so many ways. Uh, we probably, you know, speaking of North America, which is you know our largest region, um, it only makes up two countries, you know, it's the US and Canada, whereas the EMEA region, the Europe, Middle East, Africa region is, there's like 61 countries. So you can imagine the differences in, in each of these regions in, in the programming that you're offering and the types of show elements that you have and, and the way that you run your expos. You know, I was in Europe, you know, for the expo and in Singapore, and, and I noticed uh, their audiences crave different things. You know, they value different things uh, and we have to be mindful of that. And so really regionalizing the organization has helped us to capitalize on that. And I think that you're going to see more and more of that moving forward where we're really speaking to our U.S. and Canadian membership here in North America more than anyone. Uh, and each region will continue to do that. So I, you know, I think it's the right move and it allows us to meet the needs of our members in a more specific way. Can you also talk about how that has impacted changes made within the uh, within the committees of the association as well to make some more regionally focused and some more globally focused? Yeah, so there was a, the board appointed a, a committee restructure task force that take a look at our committees. We had well over 50 committees in the organization, which you can imagine is is a lot of committees uh, with a lot of task and and a lot to manage. And so I think they just looked at it as what's the most, you know, logical and efficient way to manage that. And I think they came up with a great plan that the board has approved and, and we're working on internally. And um, some of it is more regionally focused than global. I think there's still some global committees that'll do some of that oversight, but I think in general, these regional committees will really focus on what's best for the members in the region. And I think that's important. Um, we're still a global organization and that's never going to change and, and we'll always be focused on that. And there's some, you know, synergy and similarities, you know, that we can use globally, but certainly, um, you know, we have this 
I'll give you one small example. You know, we have this giant, you know, show in Orlando uh, with all these trade booths and all these things. And, and Latin America, for example, doesn't have a trade show per se. And so when they put together a summit and they do some type of trade booths or trade connections, you know, they're very successful at it. And it's because they don't have it in that region. And yes, they can come to our show, but not everyone can. So that's a great example of that region doesn't have a trade show. So let's put one there. Let's put something there where it gives their manufacturers and suppliers a, a way to connect with those members. So it's a great way we've adapted and, and we'll continue to do it uh, on a regional basis. So speaking of the region, if we can kind of zoom in on North America and Canada just for a second, there are so many different attraction types that fall under the uh, IAP umbrella. Certainly a, a family entertainment center owner might not need or desire the same things as a, a large a theme park operator or a zoo or an aquarium. So that's another balancing act, I think, that you probably have to uh, have to wage in terms of how you support the entire industry. So I'm curious maybe to peel back the curtain or peel back the onion a little bit about how you do that to make sure that your programming and your, your expos are really supporting the entire industry. Mm. Yeah, another great question. You guys are good at this. You guys are <laughs> attractions pros. Doing a few years. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a, there's a little more science behind it than you would think. You know, we obviously have a very good handle on, uh, you know, where our members come from, you know, where the bulk of our members are from and and the members that we do have, what they want us to focus on. And, and that's through, you know, listening to them and, and our committee involvement and our task forces. And I think, uh, you know, the FEC community is, is a very big part of our membership. And so at Expo, you'll see a large amount of FEC you know, content, you know, we have a few featured lunches, we have a reception, we have uh, probably more FEC related sessions than than any other constituency. But that doesn't mean any of the others are any less important. We make sure that that even our smaller constituencies, for example, maybe the museum side, uh, that we're still offering content that keeps them engaged at IAPA and gives them a reason to be a member and and interact with everybody. I think the the good news about all of it is, is I think if you take, because I have a little bit of an FEC background, a water park background, you know, ice arena, entertainment, whatever, but the core of that is the same everywhere, right? Everybody has ticketing. Everybody has maintenance. Everybody has to focus on safety. Everyone has all the same core elements. And so I don't think that we're that far apart as constituents. Uh, I think everybody shares the same problems with guests. Everybody shares a lot of the same issues. And, and that's what IAPA focuses on is, is how do we get the best results for our members, uh, you know, based on those concerns. And I think luckily uh, we, we share it all. HR2, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's funny you say that there that there is more science to it than most people realize. Because if let's say we're just talking about IAPA Expo, you know, in particular, you're going there, you know that you know there there might be attendance in the thirty thousands, or it's been north of forty thousand in in some year, which sounds extremely overwhelming. And how am I going to find the people I'm I'm going to need to talk to? Uh, whereas, uh, you know, Matt and I, and, and probably many other people, refer to the expo as a family reunion. But it's like, how can you how can you call uh, you know, a, a convention with 30 or 40,000 people, a family reunion. Well, that's probably that science in there at work that I'm directed to the people I, I want to see, the people that I need to see. And as a result, we're, we're reconnecting year over year. Uh, and then, you know, those constituencies have have the path that they're able to go on. And you can tell that they're you're able to be guided through the experience without getting too lost or too distracted, despite the fact that there's a lot of potentially distracting things on the trade show floor. So, uh. yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think it was interesting um, when I came down here to IAPA and started to connect again with most of the people I'd met over the years as, as to how big my network had grown before I even got here. And I think if anybody, including you guys, I, I know you guys have been at it a long time, but people who've just come to the show once a year for many years, which is a lot of, of my friends back home, I think they'd be amazed if they actually took a pencil and paper to how many people they've met over the years and are still connected with, because it, it's really a high number and it it never stops. And I think that that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, you know, being at IAP is being able to be a part of that and and really, um, you know, make those connections flourish and and just 
bring these people together because I'm telling you, it's it's the answer to all of our problems in our industry. And and there's you bring all these minds together and it, it makes such a huge difference. And we, our team here is is so good and and so committed. And you know, that that science side, I think a lot of people don't realize you know, how much goes into this programming and the stuff we do. We're not a large team, you know, we're about a hundred globally that work on all of the products and services we offer everywhere, but we do everything that the parks do. You know, we, we have marketing, we have operations, you know, we have public relations, we have government relations, you know, we have education, we have membership, you know, we have so many moving parts, just like any park. And, you know, it takes a small army to execute those things. And, and, just like you, we have metrics and, and ROI and, and things that we need to keep an eye on as well. And so we're no different. And uh, I think that really speaks well to how hard our team works and how, what a great team we have and, and you know, how much they're focused on what we do for our members. You know, Michael, one of the things I'm curious about, because so far we've talked a lot about IAPA and the people kind of within IAPA, but there's other associations out there, you know, the WWA and Florida Attractions and bowling proprietors. And, um, you know, they are all viable associations in their own right, you know, focusing on maybe a very specific element of the industry. So I'm just curious, like, what is the relationship like, or maybe the the cooperation uh, between all those all those different associations where, you know, some are serving the same group, but maybe a little bit more specifically. Yeah, I think uh, it's a lot like what I was saying about uh, members who come to our show, uh, operators who, you know, I think initially they're, you know, reluctant, right? It's like, well, do I want that company to come see what I'm doing at my front gate, you know, cause I, I feel like we really did something cool here. I don't know if I want to share it, but then they realize the benefit of that. And I think we're no different. These associations are nothing but good for us. Uh, most of their members are members of IAPA anyway. Uh, but I think we do a great job of working with them. They help us get the word out on important issues. Um, we attend all of their shows just like they attend ours uh, or their meetings. Uh, because I think it's important that we're all together in this again, whether it's, uh, you know, AIMS as a safety conference or ASTM developing safety standards, you know, we're, we're heavily involved in all that, but even our local and regional associations, CAPA, NIAPA, PAPA, all of them, uh, very important to us. And, and we very much uh, uh, cherish our relationships with them and want to continue those. I think it's super important. And you can tell it's the you know rising tide lifts all ships type so type of mentality that uh, the associations I I've never gotten the perception that the associations try to compete with each other but rather the more they can support each other the more they can help each other out with IAPA being so broad and serving all these constituencies and then uh, something like BPAA of being very niche and specific with bowling and then all of those those other associations whether it's uh, facility type or whether it's regionally that they've They've got they've got their own uh, set of priorities that I would say would complement IAPA and, and vice versa. Um, another question I, that I do have, and, and kind of going back to things that are things that are new or things that are changing a little bit this year, uh, the awards uh, that there's we've seen some some modifications to that. So historically, the awards are are giving out during IAPA Expo, but uh, that's not the case uh, this year. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the modifications made to that program? Sure, sure. That was actually one of my first assignments when I got to IAPA as, as I was handling the Brass Ring Awards. And, uh, you know, the company I worked for, we won several Brass Rings over the years. Uh, I remember accepting those and, and it was a great honor and I loved it. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's a great example of IAPA just trying to continue to meet the needs of our members and and wow them and make sure that we really offer something important that people can be proud of. And so the decision was made to kind of move the brass ring ceremony. You know, IAPA Expo is full of so many things. I mentioned we have 175 educational sessions and special events. And, you know, brass rings is just another one of those things. And, you know, we're, we're looking at some of these things that maybe we can peel off to make them put more attention on those, uh, give them the attention they deserve. Uh, but also maybe free up a little more time at Expo for people. And Brass Rings was one of those. So we have the IAPA Honors, which will take place this year in March. And it will, uh, you know, take the place of the Brass Rings Excellence Awards uh, at Expo, but it'll also include our Hall of Fame Service and YP of the Year Awards. 
and it'll be a standalone event. It just so happens it will be a, a, a an event that will move from region to region, but it just so happens this year it will take place at the same time as the North America Summit. So it will be in Las Vegas this year, and, and the North America Summit will follow immediately after the uh, awards uh, celebration day and, and gala that night. So I think in this case, it gives uh, our members kind of a one-stop shop, so they can do both if they want. Um, but I think it's a great first step in seeing you know, what this can be and how we can honor our members best. So, Michael, up to this point, we've kind of given you some softball questions. So I think it's now time to get into the really, really tough question. Are you ready? Oh, here we go. What's your favorite attraction? Oh, oh wow. Oh, well, I would say that's too broad of a question. <laughs> because, you know, there's I, I love so many attractions. I, I will tell you what. And, and nobody will believe this, but I have a true appreciation for almost everything I see, whether I'm at a museum, at, a, at an FEC, at a, I look at, coming from the operator side, I look at the effort that it took these organizations to, to put, whether it's theming or, or the idea or the monetization, whatever it is in any attraction uh, blows my mind. So um, you know, I do have some favorites uh, and I'll give you a couple examples, but um, I do appreciate things everywhere I go. I, I get true joy and I'm, I'm very lucky to be in a position that I get to see a lot of uh, new things that are, that are coming out in this industry. And I just love all of them. Um, but there's things I, I don't fully appreciate probably, but I love. So of course I went to the newest Meow Wolf installation and of course, it blew my mind. I don't know that I fully understood it all, but it was amazing to me. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've been to a few uh, museum installations that just blew my mind. But I would say this, the way I judge a great attraction is when I see, I do a lot of them, especially with my daughter, and I like to see people's reaction. And, and it just so happens I'm in Orlando, so I do the attractions here a lot. And there's one particular ride that every time you get off this ride, the people around you are blown away and the looks on their faces, the comments. And I mean, it's every time. And that's uh, Hagrid's motorbike adventure at Universal. I think it's a home run. I think they tell a great story. The ride is exciting. Um, it isn't just that it's Harry Potter. It's, it's that they did a great job. And I think there's other rides like that, but that's the one that I won't hesitate to take anyone on. I enjoy every time I ride it. It's something that truly almost everyone can ride. And you come off of there like, wow, that that was something. So I think you'll see more of that, more and more of that as, as we go forward and, and everyone tries to outdo each other. Yeah, well said. So the second hard question here, and uh, everyone says they always have a trouble answering this one. And if you weren't in this industry, what would you be doing? Oh God, I'd be miserable. <laughs> um, I think I'd be miserable. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, uh, I will tell you, I took a, I took a class in college that I loved, and it's probably because I'm a super Type A guy, and and I'm very organized, and you know, everybody who knows me, everything's got to be in order, and you know, I'm just one of those people. And I took a production management set of courses in college, you know, where they talk about how they set up production lines for building cars, for building products and different things. And oh my God, that really fascinated me. So I feel like had I not got into this industry as young as I did, I probably would have went in that direction. I think I, I would have enjoyed that and, and been very good at it. I don't think it would have been as fun, but, uh, <laughs> but I would have enjoyed it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Michael, we are excited that you chose this industry. I, I learned something today that you and I have in common more than other touch points and things like that that we've uh, talked about throughout the years is that both of us listened to our mom when it came to go get a job at the amusement park. So I am so glad that you listened to your mom and uh, that you were able to spend some time with us today. If you have, um, you know, someplace that you would send people to either learn more about IAPA or to get in touch with you uh, directly, where would you send them? Yeah, you can always go to our website at IAPA.org, I-A-A-P-A. -A -A. I know that's a, that's a mouthful for most people. And Usually when I tell them IAPA, they're like, what? what? Uh, or uh, mshelton at iapa.org. And you can reach out to me anytime. And, and I usually respond very quickly because I love our members.
Excellent. We will put those in the show notes so people can access them very easily. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. We are so thankful to have had the chance to, to talk to you. And for everyone out there watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.